welcome to Coming Home, to survive and thrive in homeschooling. This week we are thinking about Anzac Day and other Remembrance Days. Countries honour their war dead. For us here in New Zealand, there is Anzac Day, which stands for Australia New Zealand Army Corps. This acronym came about during World War I as our men often fought together. Every town and city in New Zealand has a war memorial. They record the names of their war dead. Originally, these were for the Great War between 1914 and 1918. Names were added from the later World War II and other wars during the 20th century. Every Anzac Day, tens of thousands of people wearing poppies gather at these cenotaphs, lay wreaths and remember the fallen. On each memorial are the words, lest we forget. The 25th of April is our day to remember, Anzac Day. I'm not sure celebrate is the right word. It refers to the day our soldiers were landed at the ill-fated Gallipoli Beach. I remember when I was in my teens, going to the dawn parade with my father. We commemorate at dawn, as that was when the boats were landed at Gallipoli. There were more returned servicemen and women than the general public. The feeling was that the dawn parade would, like each veteran, die out. But during the 1980s, the renaissance of heritage and wanting to know where we'd come from began. As a result, Anzac parades, dawn services and memorial gatherings increased in numbers attending. The veterans are fewer now, there are no servicemen left from World War I and a dwindling number of World War II veterans each year. But the public refuse to forget. And this is bringing about a purpose and a pride to many as we consider the seriousness of what was fought for. For World War I, it is true, some went for the adventure to defeat the Hun and said they'd be back by Christmas. They had no idea of the hell they were going to. What did they fight for? The simplest word would be they fought against totalitarianism and for the freedom to live in the peace they had become accustomed to. It is important to recall what political systems were trying to be forced upon our forebears and seriously ask how are they similar to today? Are we in danger of losing what our forebears fought and died for? It is a sobering question to consider. It is easy to romanticise war, and many books and movies have done so. Most tend to gloss over some facts, or at least underplay them. I heard Saving Private Ryan was the closest a movie had got to reality. Some veterans were heard to say coming from the theatre, the only thing missing was the smell. It's not a movie I feel I need to watch. In our homeschooling days, we had a World War I poem on our wall when we were learning about Anzac Day. Written by Siegfried Sassoon and his experience of the war, it goes like this. I knew a simple soldier boy who grinned at life in empty joy, slept soundly through the lonesome dark and whistled early with the lark. In winter trenches cowed and glum, with crumps and lice and lack of rum, he put a bullet through his brain. No one ever spoke of him again. You smug-faced crowds with kindling eye, who cheer when soldier lads march by, sneak home and pray you'll never know the hell where youth and laughter go. Four years ago, it was the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I. On the lawns of our Auckland War Memorial Museum, there was a named white cross for every fallen soldier. It was sobering indeed to see the thousands of them in perfect lines and rows across the grass, each one for a dead soldier, a son, husband, father, uncle. It needs thinking about. The first casualty of war is the truth. This is an old saying, and it's just as true today as it was in ancient times. In the modern times of instant information, we can be constantly watching like a bizarre reality TV show. 
For your sanity's sake, limit the time you spend watching the news and certainly limit your children's exposure to it. Yes, I know they need to know the reality of life and war, but they are children. Let them be children. As for you, how do you know if what you're hearing and watching is true? Well, you don't, but you can be sure it's not all as it is presented. It's been suggested to watch or read about five different versions by countries different to yours. Lay them over each other and try to sift and see what they have in common. Watching five different mainstream media news channels is to watch five things that are the same. It's hard, so take what you think you know with a pinch of salt. So, what do we teach our children? Firstly, as much as we want peace, the reality is war will always be with us. We mothers especially do not want to see our sons, brothers and husbands go to war. Too many have known that heartbreak. However, as much as I recoil from this possibility, I also know there are some things worth fighting for and to defend what is yours. Tell the stories of your family's history, those who went to war and came back, and those who did not. Do you have memorabilia to show? We have medals from a great-great-uncle who fought at Gallipoli and was invalided out. And more significantly, my great-grandfather's medal. He died six weeks before armistice in France. He left three little orphaned boys at home in New Zealand. The eldest was my grandfather, and he was six when his father left and never saw him again. The effects of war ripple down the decades. My husband's great-uncle also fought and died in the same battle, even though they didn't know each other and came from different parts of New Zealand. It seemed a tad odd that we should have had this in common when we met and married some 70 years later. We visited the gravesite in Cambrai, northern France, on the Belgian border a few years ago. It is sobering to walk around previous battlegrounds where these two men died. The graves are kept impeccably by their French caretakers, and we are grateful for this continuing mark of respect and gratitude from the French people. Armistice Day always gets a mention in November. At 11am on the 11th day of the 11th month, 1918, the peace treaty was signed. In New Zealand, we don't stop to remember, but in England, several years ago, we were driving to Cambridge and had to stop for petrol. The hour of 11am came and everybody stopped for two minutes. The simple action of foregoing whatever you were doing at the time was a significant experience for us. I wish it was a part of our culture here in New Zealand. What to teach our boys? Do we stop our boys from playing war games and with toy guns? And what about computer war games? My take on this is boys will always play war games, shooting bows and arrows and such. If you take a toy gun off them, they'll use their fingers or a clothes peg. As much as it grates our feminine sensibilities, boys need to know how to fight fair and how to defend their family and, if necessary, their country. Teach them how to negotiate, how to apologise and what justice is. Teach them how to walk away from unnecessary tussles and what is honourable. That may be hard as it's difficult to know ourselves where the line is, but these things are worth thinking about. Part of homeschooling is preparing them for responsible adult life and some of our children will grow up to participate in important democratic decisions and policy making. It would be a mistake to hide them from the ugly reality of conflict. Talking to veterans. There aren't many left now, but if you have one in your family, church or network, arrange for your children to interview them. Perhaps a returning serviceman or woman in your family wrote their memoirs. There are plenty of well-written books suitable for a range of ages to use with your children at this time of the year. There are soldiers turned authors whom you can read about. J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings clearly have his great war experiences woven into the story. 
and C.S. Lewis is another. Play The Last Post and learn how it came about and why we still play it and why do we wear poppies. We may have won the war, but you'll find war crimes on both sides, not just the losing countries. The victors have their dark secrets too. This was a difficult episode for me to put together, as I prefer not to spend emotional currency on war. However, I recognise it as being my own version of trying to turn from what must be faced. It is every mother's fear. Lest we forget. We must remember and continue to pray we learn from history. Our freedom to live our way is in danger in the West. We need to remember what they fought and died for, hoping that we do not need to do it again. So find the books, interview whom you can, go to the dawn parades and other remembrances, but be sure to teach your children about war. I'll finish with the ode often said at funerals of returned servicemen and women and in general memorial services. It is from the poem For the Fallen by Lawrence Binion, published in 1914. They shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn at the going down of the sun and in the morning we will remember them. We will remember them.